this thesis is about evaluating and constructing call graphs. Um, so let me first briefly explain what they are and what we can uh, use them for. Uh, um, a call graph itself is a foundation of a static analysis a data structure that captures possible execution time relationship between different methods. And while methods are represented as nodes in a graph, an edge represents a call from one method to another. Um, let's take a look at the program on the left-hand side. Here we see a Java program that computes and prints the 10th Fibonacci number. And now, how do we construct its core graph? With its main method in line three, the program has a well-defined entry point where we can now start to construct a core graph. And within that method, we find two method calls, one to the constructor of app and one to app's print fib method. Next, these methods become reachable and we can examine them. While examining a print fib, we discover two more method calls, one to fib, which is also a recursive method um, and therefore calls itself, and print line, which code is not shown here. Once we have processed all reachable methods, uh, we now have constructed the call graphs program, uh, the program, the call graph of the program, um, which is small and neat, but in reality, call graphs are way bigger and look not as nice as this one. So actually they look more like this. And that example is still a small call graph. So as we saw on the last slide, a program's callings relationship can be very confusing. Um, so call graphs can directly be used to comprehend programs and also to detect unused methods, which then maybe can be deleted from the program. Besides, call graphs are required for every single interprocedural static analyses, which are analyses that require information from either calling or called methods. For example, optimizing compilers uh, use them to perform method inlining. But they are also used and required in general data flow analysis. Um, for example, when we want to track values throughout the program across the boundaries of methods. Um, the main specific application of data flow analysis would, for example, be an analysis that wants to detect SQL injections. <clears throat> and as you can see, call graphs are at the very core of interprocedural static analysis, um, which implies that they impact the results of their uh, client analysis immediately. Um, and one thing is that when a car graphs uh, impact its client analysis, we also have to take care that it's reasonable sound. Um, and car graphs have been the focus of research for a while now, and then the term soundiness came up. Uh, in 2015, a group of eight researchers from eight different institutes published the soundiness manifesto that postulates soundy is the new sound. And soundy means that a static analysis is sound a modular particular set of language features in API that it doesn't support and therefore ignores them. One reason to ignore language features is that they are just impossible to support precisely and would introduce uh, too much imprecision in the client analysis. For example, resolving a reflective call without any information about the strings that are passed to the API, it is statically just not decidable um, where the call has to be resolved to, and then we would have to introduce uh, a call edge to every available me method that is available in the program. And that of course leads to a lot of imprecision. Um, hence, those researchers argue that we must deliberately accept unsoundness uh, in our call graphs or in our static analyses to obtain practical uh, and usable static analyses. Um, but the question is, we have to ask ourselves, what is actually the incarnation of that manifesto in the area of core graph construction? And core graph construction has a very long history of research reaching back uh, into the 70s. So I also want to mention why they are still interesting today. And when we look back, we realize that much of the previous research in the compiler and static analysis community on call graph construction for object-oriented progr uh, programs focused on the resolution of dynamically dispatched method calls. But what it seems to have um, received less attention here are other language features in API, which by the way, also evolve over time. 
For example, um, when we consider Java 8 upwards, the compiler uses a new, <coughs> newly introduced bytecode instruction to compile uh, new language features as lambdas. Additionally, there's plenty of work on core graph for standalone applications and research on library core graphs was neglected, even though libraries are notably different than applications, um, since they of course are meant to be extended. So we asked the question, where does the state of the art and core graph construction stands with regard to the less research aspects? And while looking for an answer, we realized that we even lack the means to systematically answer these questions, um, which motivated the contributions of this thesis, which can be summarized in three different blocks. Um, in the first block, systematic assessment of quality, uh, of core graph quality, we will present our methods and tools which we use to qualify the soundiness of state-of-the-art core graph algorithms and also apply them to document their capabilities. In the second block, we will present our novel framework for modular core graph construction. And in the third block, we will cover soundiness issues and algorithms that are specific to the construction of library core graphs. So let's jump into the first block first. Um, and this block is organized as follows. First, I will briefly guide you through the methods and tools that we use to assess the state of the art core graph algorithms. And afterwards, I will present the capability of the examined algorithms and end with the results of a study we performed in the wild. Um, at this point, you don't have to understand the complex picture as a whole. I will iterat uh, iteratively guide you through the figure now and slowly build it up. And let's just now start with the foundation of our tool chain, um, our core graph assessment and test suite, in short, CATS. So CATS Foundation is a large collection of 102 test cases, which we designed after studying um, the JVM specification and also state-of-the-art core graph frameworks. Each single test case tests a unique language feature or API call, which is relevant in core graph construction. Um, additionally, all test cases are also annotated with the expected call edges um, and please note that all the annotations we did aimed for uh, soundness and not for precision. Um, then when we have all the test cases, they are compiled to an executable Java program, um, which we uh, additionally, we also provide advanced test cases where we manually, for example, engineered the guide code because we couldn't create it with the uh, Java compiler. Um, and we also provide an interface which allows us to run the test cases against arbitrary core graph algorithms. Um, as a result, we can obtain one core graph per test case. Um, and then we have that. We can now check whether the core graphs contain all expected call edges that were specified in the respective test case. Um, and when we now combine all the test results for one particular algorithm, we obtain an algorithm fingerprint stating um, it feature, the features it supports. Okay, so how does it look like? This table shows the results of applying our test framework um, on 10 different core graph algorithms from four different frameworks, namely Zoot, Vala, Opal, and Dupe. And with that, we created their fingerprints um, and therefore also captured their soundiness and their capabilities. I don't want to discuss the results in detail here. Um, however, what I want to point out is um, that the overall feature support is very small, except Opal's core graph, which supports roughly 83% of all the features we identified. The average number of supported features um, is for all the other algorithms with 47% significantly lower. But okay, now that we know that the feature coverage uh, from the state-of-the-art frameworks and implementations is not that good, um, we still have to ask ourselves the questions, do these features and APIs actually play an important role in real-world code or are they just edge cases? And to figure that out, we need to be able to find the features and their locations in actual programs. 
And exactly for that purpose, we developed Hermes. <clears throat> and Hermes is our um, self-developed static code query engine. Um, if you want more information about Hermes, you can have a look into my thesis. Um, and the queries in Hermes are basically static analyses where each analysis identifies different features that are modeled in our uh, test cases. For example, we have queries that identified relevant API calls. Uh, for example, the new instance method of the reflection API. Um, and when we now take all the queries and run them against the project, we obtain a report that provides us um, with the features they occur in the project and also where we can find them. In total, we develop 15 queries that cover 107 out of the 122 test case features that we have identified. Um, now, the next obvious step is to apply all those queries um, to several corpora. Here we used the X corpus, which is an established corpus, um, and also several handpicked corpora consisting of real world projects from Java, Scala, Ruby, uh, <clears throat> Kotlin, Clojure, and also Android apps. And additionally, we took the most uh, top 50 most popular libraries from Raven Central to study um, how the features we identified are prevalent in those programs. Here, each box in the heat map indicates how often a feature occurs in a given corpus. Um, yellow boxes indicate that the feature uh, occurrences are very few, and red boxes indicate that the feature is very frequent. And when we, for example, look uh, at native methods, we see that they are frequently used almost everywhere, except in the Kotlin's project that we uh, handpicked. Um, and when we take a closer look at lambdas, we can see that some of them occur more often than others, and they also do not occur in all corpora. Um, why is that? So um, Java, uh, Java 8 is not used in all the programs. Um, but actually we require support for it for most of the corpora, especially um, when we don't analyze Android or Clojure code. Um, also, APIs like serialization or reflection are frequently used across all corpora. Um, here, please note that the test cases TR1 to TR9 represent really simple reflection cases where the string used in the API calls is immediately available. Um, hence, they can also be supported statically with reasonable precision. Um, and we strongly recommend to support reflection and serialization, at least partially. Whatsoever, we definitely learned that we um, identified relevant language features and that they are used throughout many different programs. Um, but we also see that the program's feature usage is highly specific. And when we want to quantify uh, a core graph's soundness, we must consider the program that we want to construct a core graph for. Um, so we kind of need to do it in a project specific way. And now, as we have the means to document the core graph's algorithm's capabilities, and we are also able to find those features in arbitrary programs, we can finally combine these pieces of information um, and try to quantify a core graph soundness in a project specific manner. And next, let's see how we can achieve this. Um, using the algorithm's profile and the locations of the tested features, we can identify problematic call sites. On the left hand side, of the figure, you can see the algorithm's fingerprint. It contains all features and whether they are supported by a specific core graph algorithm um, that we use to analyze the project. And on the right-hand side, you can see information that is extracted by Hermes. This part shows how often a specific feature occurs in the program and where and in which method it can be found. And when we finally combine this information with the computed core graphs, um, we now know if the feature location is reachable within the core graph or not. 
<clears throat> okay. So whenever an unsupported feature that is present in the program, here the feature represented by TR1, and it is also reachable within the core graph, we know that the core graph is definitely sound um, at this location and at this core site. And when we do this for all feature occurrences, we can kind of quantify the soundiness uh, of the core graph. But in this case, where a feature occurs in a method that is not reached by the core graph, we have a, a conditional source of unsoundness. Here, we just can't decide whether the core graph does not reach this method due to its unsoundness, or if the program's execution with the given entry points does not reach the method. However, this is still a measure for uh, further potential unsoundness, right? Um, but whether unsoundness is toler uh, tolerable or not depends on our use case. And in a practical setting, we often have the case that we analyze the same project over and over again. And in such a scenario, having a precise call graph is particularly interesting. So why can't we use Judge to improve a, a program's call graph manually? Um, here, we can apply Judge, then we can inspect all the locations that introduce unsoundness, uh, manually inspecting, uh, inspect them and figure out uh, which call edges or entry points are required, and then add them manually to the call graph. And when we do the test process iteratively, um, we can improve the core graph soundiness until we obtain a sound and precise core graph. <clears throat> and then all our static analyses will be, will be better. Um, so let's recap what we have found so far. We identified language features and APIs that lead to soundiness. And while documenting the capability of core graph construction algorithms, we realized that only roughly the half of the features are supported. Um, however, not all features are required in every program, so we kind of face the following um, dilemma. Because even if we could cover all the features in our core graph construction, it wouldn't really make sense. Because as we learned at the beginning of the talk, these features are still evolving, and there will be new features, APIs change, um, and therefore they are a moving target. Uh, additionally, as they are not required in every program, we don't need them for every program. So this kind of motivates us to design a modular approach uh, to construct core graphs, which is the second block of this talk. Um, the results of our studies showed that we must consider many different features. However, supporting them in a monolithic analysis is not really an option, since then the already complex analyses would gain even more complexity. Instead, it would be better if we would have a set of black and play sub-analyses that handle individual features and APIs. Then we need to combine the results of all those sub-analyses to compute a single core graph. And yet for the sake of um, performance and precision, when composed, the analyses need to be executed in an interleaved way. So the question is, how can we design such an art architecture that supports the requirements? Um, and to fulfill these requirements, we implemented a novel and generic approach that borrows concept from a Blackboard architecture. And the Blackboard is a shared store that keeps track of all analysis results um, and its fixed point solver coordinates the execution. Hence, the approach provides a central infrastructure that decouples modular analyses and provides modularization and also parallelization out of the box. So this way we can independently develop our analyses that can focus on single language features. Um, and this approach allows for complex systems of analyses with many interdependencies. Um, the example shown here gives a simplified overview of the design of an RTIA core graph analysis as it is implemented in Opal. Whereas the boxes with a solid border um, show us modularized analyses, the box with a dashed line represents the shared information that is stored in the black box. Um, now we have a base algorithm, the RTA analysis, that takes care of virtual calls and several other analyses that compute the call edges for the individual features. But the system also allows us to add additional analyses. 
for example, to trick strings more precisely to be able to um, deal better with reflective calls. Or we can also exchange single analysis implementations such that we can use the reflective call edges captured by, for example, Temiflex, which is a dynamic analysis. So using the system, we constructed several call graphs um, successively and added analyses for different language features and APIs. And what we see here is that we can simply add and remove feature analysis to trade off the call graph soundiness and scalability. But we can also exchange single analysis implementation to replace a sound but imprecise analysis with a soundy and precise one. Um, okay, so far, I've talked about standalone applications. And now we take a look into the peculiarities of building library call graphs and show why previous approaches have been unsound. When we analyze libraries, we require, uh, we have to make special considerations that have been ignored so far. On one hand, libraries can be extended by applications that uh, use it later on. Um, and on the other hand, Libraries usually provide a public API, uh, public API that defines its interface and therefore also its entry points. But let me first clarify why it matters that libraries can be extended. When we consider a library that provides a class entry and an interface door, and both define a method with the same signature, which is here object.getValue, um, but entry and store are not in any inheritance relationship. Um, then the call sites within the library where store.getValue is invoked, um, normally we must not consider entries get value method as a potential call target because they're not in any inheritance relationship. However, the library might be used by an application in the following way. Um, an application can define a class link that extends the class entry and implements the interface store. And if it additionally does not override um, the entries get value method, then we have to see our library call site with different eyes. Because now the store receiver object of the call might be the link class. And then the call must be dispatched to entry get value. Um, and as Java has been exploited this way, we can't ignore it and must use here what we call call by signature resolution on interface calls when we want to model all possible flows when we analyze libraries. Um, after we have now considered how libraries can be extended, we must now also think about how applications can access them. So let's start with a sound and conservative scenario which we call open package assumption. In this scenario, application developers are able to add their own classes to library packages. And in consequence, they can access all non-private methods, which then must be considered at, uh, as entry points. Here, we distinguish between a library's public API, which consists of all the methods that can be called from an application, and the library private implementation, which code can directly be used by an application. <clears throat> However, this scenario is very conservative and not optimal precision-wise. Um, so we can try to trade off precision for soundness, but still we need this, this scenario and um, be very conservative because when we do security analyses, we might uh, need to be conservative because people want to break our, our library. Um, but that is imprecise is not the only reason that we want to change it because library developers also want to write code that is untouched by application developers because it otherwise might break their library, for example. And in the JDK8, within the MimeTime class, we found the following comment, uh, which reads, this is not, repeat, not, a public class, data flavor is the public interface, and this is provided as a private, that is as a not public helper class. So obviously someone wanted to make sure that this code is not used outside of the library. So how can we use this piece of information? Um, now, we want a more soundy call graphs, 
and developers want to write library private code. And as a consequence, we came up with a closed package assumption, which reflects the developer's wishes. Here, we assume that application developers cannot add classes to library packages, um, resulting in no means to access, uh, for instance, package visible classes. And this assumption holds for the most popular libraries on Maven Central. Hence, the uh, applications can access less library code, and therefore its public API shrinks to only a part of the methods. Despite that this scenario is based on a soundy decision as it improves the call graph's precision, um, but ignores possible execution time scenarios, is it still valuable for code quality analysis because our resulting call graphs will be more, result, uh, more precise. So using our new discoveries, we designed five call graphs algorithm, uh, algorithms that either adhere to the open um, or closed package assumption. And besides, we also found new features for our modular call graph construction approach. On the one hand, we have to add, um, depending on the program we analyze, an analysis that computes the call graph's entry points accordingly. Um, and on the other hand, we analyze libraries. So we need to add an analysis that resolves interface-based calls um, by signature in order to model possible extension scenarios. And finally, we used one of our call graphs in a case study on the JDK, where we also discovered over 600 unused methods, which can potentially be removed. Um, so let me summarize my talk. In the first part, we learned how to systematically assess the quality of call graph algorithms. And we learned that on average, only 50% of the relevant language features and APIs are supported by state-of-the-art tools. Then um, we use this to present the first imperative approach to construct call graphs modularity, <laughs> modularly and SAR that we um, now have a system where we can systematically trade off between position, scalability, and soundiness according to the use case. And in our third part, we discussed further features that are particularly relevant um, to libraries and therefore open also uh, open up a new line of core graph research. Um, overall, we improved the state of the art in call graph construction and created a solid foundation for future work in multiple areas. Concerning the first block, it would be really great if we could enhance our framework and extend our studies. Because after publishing our work, we were in contact with all the framework maintainers. Um, and it would be interesting to see how all the frameworks have evolved in terms of feature support, because people were actually working on them. Additionally, it would also be nice to try to quantify the soundiness of client analyses and see um, the effects of unsound call graphs on actual clients. Um, next, in the area of modular call graph construction, it would be very interesting to go in the direction of self-adaptive static analysis, <clears throat> such that the call graph is configuring itself at construction time and just adds um, several analyses when it detects that a feature is present and then it has to as it to be sound. Um, so I think that would be very interesting. And additionally, it would also be great if we could extend our modular approach um, to be able to handle context sensitive call graphs, as it is not obvious, uh, obvious in every case how we can reuse our feature analyses uh, in context sensitive settings, because they are very um, many options uh, for context sensitivity. Um, and it would be interesting to have context sensitive call graphs where we can reuse our features. Um, but also our last block enables further research opportunities. As we created more or less the domain of library call graphs, uh, it should be possible to design more precise algorithms um, for constructing library call graphs. And additionally, just to uh, give an idea, we can try to get a better approximation um, how libraries are actually accessed. For example, we could use actual library clients, um, see how they use them a library, and then use this information to construct libraries, uh, library call graphs. 
Um, so those are all the publications related to my thesis. Those are all my other publications. And now I want to thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take your questions.